Vmax decreases. Now, I'll tell you something that will surprise you, and I'm not going to explain it here, although, again, if you want to come ask me, I'll be happy to explain it to you. KM stays the same in, in non-competitive. KM does not change in non-competitive inhibition. The short answer for why is we can't measure a KM on an inactive enzyme. So the inactive enzymes don't enter into the picture. Okay, But come see me if you find that confusing. Now, so we've got two very different inhibitory mechanisms. Competitive, where Vmax stays the same, but KM increases. And non-competitive, where Vmax decreases, but KM stays the same. Okay? Make sense? Yes? So, just out curiosity, for the negative feedback and inhibition, is it usually non-competitive? So, uh, that's a very good question, actually. It turns out that the non-competitive feedback is, uh, I'm sorry, that the, the um, uh, feedback inhibition is almost always non-competitive in nature because it's binding to a different site than the active site. That's exactly right. Yes, Matt. So when you say that CAM stays the same, you mean uh, it's the same uh, concentration that it originally was in the original uh, CMAX? That's correct. Okay. So when I'm saying that the CAM stays the same, it's compared to the uninhibited reaction. <coughs> okay? Compared to the uninhibited reaction for a non-competitive inhibition, it's the same as the uh, as the as the uh, the non-inhibited. They're exactly the same. Okay. All right. So now we talked last time about how V versus S. Uh, we had V versus S plots, and I also talked about Lyme Weaver Burke plots. This is kind of a dumb figure, in my opinion, but it illustrates at least one important principle. Let's say I told you that I have a non, I have a competitive inhibitor, and I'm comparing the the rates of this reaction with a non-competitive. I'm sorry, I'm comparing a competitive inhibitor with an uninhibited reaction. That is no inhibitor at all. The first thing that should pop into your mind is Vmax doesn't change, Km increases, right? Remember we had the line weaver burke plot, and I told you that. The y-intercept was 1 over Vmax. So if I had an uninhibited reaction here shown in blue, and I compared it to an inhibited reaction, just look at either one of these lines. It doesn't matter which one, but don't look at both because it'll confuse you. Okay? If I compared the Vmax for an, an, an no inhibitor compared to an inhibitor, I would expect that the two Vmaxes would be the same, and that means they're going to cross at the same point on the y-axis because 1 over Vmax is going to be the same as well. Right? I remember also that the, the x-intercept was minus 1 over Km. Okay? Minus 1 over Km. If Km increases, then minus 1 over Km must get closer to 0. Must get closer to 0. If I had, let's say, 1, uh, let's say that the, the, um, the, um, uh, Km for a reaction was 2, okay, for an uninhibited reaction. Minus 1 over 2 would appear here, okay, and the inhibited reaction, the Km went up to 10, I would have minus 1 over 10, which would be closer to 0, be closer in here, okay? So, this defines two points. The, the song I sang yesterday talked about how two points define the line. The two points are. The Vmax doesn't change. And I know that somewhere in here, closer to the y-axis, is the other point. Now this point, I can draw a line through, and I've got the, in the inhibited line. Okay. So just from two points, I can tell what the rates of the reaction are going to be. And I know that Vmax is not going to change. I know that minus 1 over Km is going to change. So if I ask you to predict what would happen given a certain type of inhibition, I would expect that you would be able to do that. Now, when I look at non-competitive, what's going to happen? The y-intercept is going to change, and what's going to happen to the x-intercept? It's going to be the same, right? The y-intercept changes because Vmax is changing, right? Does the y-intercept go up or down? I'm going to say down. 
How many say up? Okay. If it gets if if Vmax gets smaller, one over smaller must be larger. It goes up. Let's look at that plot. So let's look at what happens when we have non-competitive inhibition. When we have non-competitive inhibition, there we are. There's the uninhibited and there's the inhibited. The y-intercept has gone up. And don't worry about the equations. We're not going to mess with that. But minus 1 over Km has not changed because, again, Km has not changed. Now, where students run into trouble on these plots is they forget that one of the lines means no inhibitor. I'll see the student exams and they'll write down, oh, competitive inhibitor here and non-competitive inhibitor up here. No, that's not the way, that's not what I told you. This is no inhibitor. This is, in this case, a non-competitive inhibitor. So you're always comparing a non-competitive to a no inhibitor or a competitive to a no inhibitor. But you're not comparing non-competitive to competitive. Doesn't, doesn't follow that way. Okay? Questions on that? Good question. Um, as we're getting more sophisticated in our knowledge of proteins and enzymes, it is increasingly becoming possible to do that. The problem is, is that that takes a lot of structural information to know, first of all, what would bind, whereas in the case of a competitive inhibitor, you know pretty much what's going to bind. Okay? And not only does it have to bind, but it also has to change the <coughs> enzyme in some way so that it's unable to catalyze the reaction. And that's very unpredictable. So there are some that are non-competitive in nature, but most of them are competitive just because of that built-in knowledge that we have about what will bind. Good question. So our question is, if you, ha if you designed a non-competitive inhibitor of an enzyme, would it have less toxic side effects, for example, or other side effects? It's hard to predict that. It's very hard to predict that, and this is true of any drug, even a competitive inhibitor. It's hard to predict what other enzymes it might bind to. When we think about side effects, the side effects are the other things that it could bind to, not the one that we're targeting. And that's going to be uh, a variable for both a competitive and a non-competitive inhibitor. So there's nothing magical about a non-competitive inhibitor in that sense. But good, very good question. Yes, back there. So uh, summarize competitive and non-competitive. So in competitive inhibition, the inhibitor can outcompete. Uh, in competitive inhibition, the substrate can outcompete the inhibitor. That means, therefore, that when we get to high substrate concentrations, the inhibitor is almost not going to be visible by the enzyme, meaning that Vmax stays the same compared to the uninhibited. But Km increases because that's at a lower concentration and it takes more substrate to outcompete the inhibitor at lower concentrations. So for, for competitive inhibition compared to uninhibited, we have a, the same Vmax, a higher Km. When we have non-competitive inhibition, they're not competing for the same site, which means that no matter how much substrate I add, I'm always going to have the same amount or the same percentage of enzyme inhibited. That's not going to change. I've effectively reduced the amount of enzyme that's active. And when I do that, I lower the Vmax. So Vmax is lowered for non-competitive inhibition. Km stays the same. Make sense? OK, you guys will be enzyme experts. I, I know seniors in biochemistry that have difficulty with recognizing that. You guys do that, I'll be very happy. OK? I'm serious. OK. All right, that's the end of the material for the exam. So we'll stop the material for the exam right there. OK? I'm not, you can obviously use this for treating disease. We're not going to talk about all that, blah, blah, blah. So the end of the material for the exam is right there. I'll also note that in the highlights, uh, when I post the highlights, probably later this evening. OK, so what I'm getting ready to talk about now will be the material for the second exam, which I know you're already looking forward to, right? <laughs> See, that's good, OK. OK, so the second exam, and we're looking right here, enzyme control. So I've already talked about a little bit of this already. So a little, bit, a little bit of what I'm going to say here is going to be sort of a review for you. 
about things I've already been talking about. I've been talking about, for example, ATCAs. You already heard how ATCAs does its thing, and I'm going to go over that again just to make sure that you understand what, I, what I've got to say there. Okay. Now, don't worry about the reactions here. ATCAs, as I said yesterday, catalyzes a reaction that is the first reaction on the way to making CTP. So there's a pathway. Whenever we talk about a pathway, we're talking about a series of connected reactions that lead to a certain thing. Okay? So a pathway to make CTP starts with very simple things and keeps building more and more of them together until finally you end up with CTP in the end. To start with the very simplest of things right here and get to CTP takes 10 steps. No, you don't need to know that. Okay? But you do need to know that this very first step does not produce CTP. Only subsequent steps down the, down the way do that. So the enzyme doesn't catalyze the formation of CTP. It catalyzes the formation of a molecule that later turns into CTP. Okay? Now, as I said last time, ATCase, and there's our enzyme right there, is inhibited by the end product of this pathway. This end product is CTP. And as I explained yesterday, if we have too much CTP, the cell has wasted energy, it's got all this stuff sitting around it shouldn't have done. So when the CTP concentration starts getting high, it becomes much more likely it's going to bind to ATCase and turn that enzyme off. Okay. This phenomenon where the end product of a pathway inhibits the first enzyme in the pathway, which is this ATCase, is called feedback inhibition. Feedback inhibition. This type of inhibition is fairly common in metabolic pathways. And it's common for the reason that I stated, which is that it's much more efficient to stop the source of the pro the source of making everything than it is to try to stop things very close to it because then we're going to accumulate all these other things that we don't want and still waste a lot of energy. Stopping the first enzyme is the most efficient way to control a pathway. Okay. So that's what the cell does. It does this by feedback inhibition. We'll see several examples of feedback inhibition in metabolic pathways this term and it's a term that I think that you should know. Okay. Here's a better view of that pathway. Okay. And they have seven, I believe it's actually ten. They're doing a shortcut. But in any event, the important thing is it's a multi-step process to make CTP. When we look at cholesterol metabolism, okay, our bodies make cholesterol. And cholesterol turns out to be something that we need. Sometimes we make too much of it. Sometimes we have too much of it. Sometimes we eat too much of it. Okay. But cholesterol in our body is made in a pathway that starts with a very, very simple two-carbon molecule and makes a great big cholesterol molecule. The overall process takes about 25 steps. Very energy intensive. And one of the things that cholesterol does is it fe feedback inhibits the first enzyme in the pathway to stop all those other intermediates from being made. If your body is metabolizing cholesterol properly, it's turning off that enzyme just dandy for you. You hear about people that can eat a dozen eggs for breakfast every day and their cholesterol level is down in the, in the nowhere range? <coughs> their body's working right. Okay? That's a good sign of that. They're not mutants. That's the way things are supposed to work. We'll talk later about sometimes why they don't work that way. Okay? All right. So feedback inhibition, I want to emphasize again, is very important 